Amen. If you'll turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 12 this morning, you can find it in the Pew Bible in front of you on page 871. I encourage you to keep open God's Word to see that this truly is God's Word to us from the Gospel of Luke. We'll begin in verse 13 this morning. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, take care, be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man produced plentiful. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I'll do this. I'll tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I'll store all my grain and all my goods. And I'll say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you. The things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself, and is not rich toward God. That's the reading of God's holy word. You may be seated. I was recently talking with a friend, and I had seen him in the week driving an older restored vehicle, one that I had not seen before. So we got talking about it, and he said, yeah, it leaks a lot of fluid, and Typically, the battery is dead, and it's kind of a pain to get it out of the garage, so I don't use it that often. I don't use it enough. It's much easier to use one of our other vehicles. And then he paused, and he said, you know, first world problems. Perhaps you've heard that phrase before, first world problems, things that we think of as problems, but really, in the grand scheme of them, are not real problems. When we talk about the subject of money and possessions, typically all that we have is first world problems. We're not concerned with what we will eat today, or where we will live, or where we will sleep, or what clothes we will wear. And yet, that is not how most of the world lives. Most of the world either does not have enough, or just barely enough to survive. None of us, and I mean that, none of us are in that boat. But that doesn't mean that we do not have problems when it comes to money and possessions. And in fact, we might have a worse problem. Sure, we don't worry about what we're going to eat or what we're going to wear or where we're going to live, but all of this money that we do have and all of this stuff and possessions makes us look at ourselves, makes us look at the world, and even makes us look at God differently and many times wrongly. That not only does our money and our possessions become a hindrance to us, but I would even say a stumbling block, an area of sin. And have we not dealt with and seen correctly and obviously confessed and repented of, it can bring about ultimately damnation. And we see that in our passage this morning. We see it from two points, greed explained and then greed illustrated. First, greed explained. Now this passage before us, just to give you due notice, is a warning to the rich And immediately as I say that, the first reaction, the first reaction in your heart, the first reaction in my heart is, well, that's not me. I'm not rich. Well, let me ask, do you have a closet of clothes? Do you have more than one pair of shoes? Do you have cupboards and pantry and fridge with food in it? Do you have a house that has more than one room? Is your house bigger than a tool shed? Do you have a bank account with any savings in it? 
If you answered yes to any of those questions, and the reality is that you answered yes to all of those questions, then you are rich. It's hard to calculate exactly, but the yearly income of most of the world is less than $10,000 a year. Remember, that is the average. So that means half of the world's population lives on less than $10,000 a year. So we are rich, and we cannot deny that. So don't say that you're not. And I don't say that to to give you a guilt complex or to say that you are in sin. Rather, covetousness is a sin of the heart. And it can be true of us no matter how much or how little we make. And likewise, there are those that are poor that are godly, and there are those that are rich that are godly, those that do not let their possessions possess them. So it's not a matter necessarily of money or the lack thereof that makes the difference, but the hearts. And therefore, this teaching is for all. And I would say for us, especially as Americans, This teaching is especially for us because this is the water that we swim in, as it were. Because our culture tells us that more is always better. And so when I speak this morning of our title of this sermon, The Rich Man's Reality, this is our reality, isn't it? And Jesus spoke about the subject of money frequently. Why? Because he knows the human heart. He knows our hearts. And therefore, we need to take heed of this, this day. Well, you see the occasion of this teaching. It comes as a result of an interruption from the crowd right in the middle of Jesus' teaching. It says someone in the crowd just blurted out, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. You see, this man just interjects, and he interjects not to to ask a question, not to get clarification of what Jesus is speaking about, but on a subject matter totally different, something that is not related whatsoever. If you've ever worked with children or youth, then you know this reality, don't you? When you're teaching a lesson and you see that little hand go up, And in the back of your mind, you're thinking, please don't let this be about your puppy dog. And sure enough, it is about their puppy dog. And then everybody in the class wants to tell you about their puppy dog as well. And it has nothing to do with anything that you are teaching on. Well, it doesn't just happen with children and youth, does it? I know as a preacher, not everyone is always thinking about what you're preaching on. There's been many a time that I've been told, good sermon, pastor, and I wasn't preaching that Sunday. (laughs) Pastor Myers has had the same, I promise you. (laughs) So I know people have a lot of things on their mind, and it's not always what is coming from this pulpit. And I can take comfort that Jesus had the same with those that heard him, because that is exactly what is taking place on this occasion. This man does not wait to be called upon, he just interjects. And what does he interject about? Well, obviously he was in a dispute, and he's in a dispute with one of his very own brothers. Because the brother would not divide, supposedly, the inheritance with him. Perhaps he was the younger brother, and his older brother was the executor of the estate, and he was not giving what he saw as rightfully his And so obviously he saw this man that interject, saw Jesus as a wise man, enough to call him teacher and rabbi. He saw him as one that had authority, perhaps one that could do something about it and possibly get him what he wanted, which he thought was rightfully his. And it makes me wonder if this was a matter that another rabbi or one of the Pharisees would have eagerly got involved with. Why? Because it involved money. And what was the 
two things, if you remember from chapter 11, that Jesus indicted the Pharisees on. He talked about how they, they wash the outside, but the inside is dirty, and what it is dirty with is wickedness, and we've seen that in the last couple of weeks, the sin of hypocrisy, and what was the other thing? Greed. And so it makes me wonder if a typical rabbi of that day would have heard those magical words of inheritance and he would have said, oh, well, come bring this to me. I'll resolve this between you and your brother. And of course, you know, you can give me a little kickback as a result of resolving your problems. Notice Jesus was not like the rabbis of his day. Look at verse 14. How does Jesus respond? Man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? This may seem a little bit harsh. It may seem like this man was coming to Jesus with a problem and Jesus is not willing to help him. In fact, dismisses him and seemingly dismisses his problem. You might even read that and say, Jesus, that was a little bit rude. But I think there's a great lesson here in even our coming to Christ and also with our dealings of our own problems as well as dealings with others' problems. Jesus knew his calling, and Jesus knows his calling. Jesus was called to be the Savior of the world, and as Savior, he was and is not called to save from all problems. See, this man thought his brother was the problem, but Jesus being the creator, being the maker, being the savior, knew that this problem that he thought was the problem was not actually his problem. That his problem was much deeper than that. That his problem was not external. His problem was internal. His problem was not with the brother. His problem was not ultimately with the inheritance, but with him. And so for Jesus, think about this, to Have Jesus solve the perceived problem, perhaps most likely would have prevented the opportunity to solve the actual problem. And that is a great lesson for us, isn't it? And it's a great lesson of how we look at our own problems and even how we bring our problems to God. There's oftentimes that we will pray things and we won't see the answers that we think we should have or the answers that we would so desire. And sometimes God will tarry in answering our prayers. We'll come to him and we'll say, God, help me with my problem. And you know what? God says, I will help you with your problem, but what you think your problem is is not actually your problem. And so I will deal with that, not with what you think is the actual problem. And what is usually the problem? It's us. It's our heart. It's our mind, it's our worldview. That's what Christ is concerned with. He's concerned with us. And so as we often sing in that famous song, the flames shall not hurt you, I only design your dross to consume and your gold to refine. That is what the Lord is doing, isn't it? He is consuming that dross and allowing the the gold, the true nature of who we are, our hearts and our soul, to be refined. And I would say this is also a great lesson in in parenting or a great lesson with friends or even in the workplace. It's not our role to solve every problem. And we're not to have a savior complex. In fact, to do so might be placing your child or placing your friend or placing your coworker or even your business in a worse place. And therefore, it takes wisdom, it takes discernment, isn't it? What is the perceived problem and what is the actual problem? And when should we step in and and where we should step in and where we should not step in with the problems of this world? Again, the real problem was not this man's brother, was not the inheritance, it was him specifically, his covetousness. And Jesus goes on to speak of covetousness, and that's oftentimes how we think of this 
nature of wanting something that is not ours, and that is the right term, but the real sin behind it is greed, isn't it? And covetousness, well, we can kind of think, well, that's, that's kind of minor. Everybody covets a little bit, right? But none of us think of us ourselves being greedy or having the sin of greed. That's kind of a, a major sin. We might admit to covetousness, but greed and being greedy, that has a little more grit to it. That's a little bit more ugly, has ugliness to it. And yet that is the sin, isn't it? Why is it that we covet? Why is it that we're covetous? It's because ultimately it comes from a heart of greed. And that was this man. He was greedy. And we as litigious Americans might say, but, 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 he, he might have had a legitimate case. And perhaps he did. Maybe his brother really was a scoundrel and was holding what was rightfully his. That can all be true, but it does not dismiss this man and it does not dismiss his heart that his heart was full of greed. So much so that it was consuming him. That he was willing to be divided in his relationship with his brother over it. He was willing to interrupt Jesus to get a verdict. We'd have to say it was an idol. It was commanding his time and his attention and even his relationships. And no doubt we have all seen it. In fact, we've all probably been a part of it. Families divided or fighting because of money or because of an inheritance. They say, and I have no reason to doubt it, the number one reason for divorce is finances. Is over the aspect of money and how it's dealt with or how it's spent or how we live with it. And that's why Jesus goes on to, to use this interjection To say what? Verse 15, take care. Be on your guard against all covetousness. Now this is the second time, if you remember, in a row where Jesus has said, take care. Or be on guard. Or as we saw last week, beware. Last week, what was the sin? It was the sin of hypocrisy. This week, the sin of greed or covetousness. And there is a a reason for this. As I mentioned, these are both the the sins of the Pharisees. And Jesus said, beware of the sins of the Pharisees. Not beware of the Pharisees, but beware of their sins. And as I mentioned last week, I think Jesus warns about these. He says, be on your guard, take care, beware, because these sins are so subtle, as it were. They can slip in so easily. It's like putting on an old pair of blue jeans. It seems to fit our fallen nature so easily and kind of feel so good, right? And therefore, it's hard to detect. It's hard to diagnose in us. And so we we would like to say hypocrite. No, I'm, I'm not a hypocrite. Greed. No, I'm not greedy. Others. Oh, yeah, I know a lot of people that are hypocrites and really greedy, but not me. Not us. It's hard to admit, isn't it? And because it's hard to admit, it's even equally hard, if not more, to get it out. As I heard it once said, sin is like a warm bed, easy to get in, hard to get out. And this is definitely one of them. That's why Jesus says, take care against all covetousness, all greed. In other words, it can be dressed up in many different ways, and yet it has the same root. And so where does all greed, where does all covetousness come from? Well, we confessed it this morning, didn't we? It was a confession of faith, but it could have equally been a confession of sin. In that 10th commandment of do not covet, what is The commandment require of us, the catechism says, it requires full contentment. Full contentment with our condition. And it goes on to say it forbids all discontentment with our estate. That's the heart of it, isn't it? And when we are not fully content, 
with our lots, with our life, with our bank accounts, with our possessions, with whatever it is, all of our circumstances, Jesus says to us, beware. Watch out. Because that's where the sprouts of covetousness and greed grow. And that is what Jesus is saying, and that is what this passage is about. And again, this is a warning to us all, children and youth, to you as well. A lesson you need to learn now, especially as American children, as American youth that that see the abundance of things that we have and, and stuff that is all around us, that is paraded before you daily. Contentment never comes in the form of money and stuff. Never. And so do not think if I get this or I have that or if I achieve X, then I will be content. It never happens. And Jesus even says as much, doesn't he? He says, one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Let me put that in modern terminology. Life does not consist in stuff. Life does not consist in money. Life does not consist in possession. Life does not consist in likes or followers or even people themselves. And so you have to ask, well, where does it lie? What does it consist of? And I think what Jesus is saying, not out loud or, or that which is spoken of here, but life, Jesus says, ultimately consists of me, of me. And we know this from the rest of Scripture. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And oftentimes when we take those things, uh, uh, the way, the truth, and the life, especially when we think about life, we go, oh, yeah, 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 I know. Jesus is, is eternal life. When I die, I will have life. That's not what I think Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, if we take out the first two, I am life. And in fact, I am the life. Isn't that what Jesus says to us today? I am the life. Not one day, no, right now. Don't think that you will find life outside of me. It is in him that we live and move and have our being. And yet, if we look Elsewhere, as we so often do, that, that life can be found in this or that, or if I can get that, then I will be a little better off. We will never find it. We will always constantly be on a wild goose chase, right? Because as soon as you achieve it, as soon as you have it, you're always looking for the next. So you remember the, the famous words of Rockefeller, how much money is enough? And he said, just a little bit more. And so if a million dollars fell into your lap right now, I would tell you it does not solve your problems. In fact, in many ways, it may make it worse. It's why the life of lottery winners is always a train wreck, isn't it? Money was not the problem. It was the love of money, the, the greed and covetousness that had them to, to buy the lottery ticket in the first place. And when they achieved it, that only grew and got worse. And so the practical application of, of this is if we're discontent, if we're depressed about our life or our lot in life or your bank account or your retirement fund or whatever it is, I tell you, if you, you don't have Jesus or if you're not trying to find life in Jesus, having these problems, quote unquote, fixed will not solve your situation. Better circumstances will not change the heart ever. Money, stuff, and people do not have the power to do that. But you know what does? Christ. Christ does. That's why Augustine in his very famous statement says of God, you've made, our, made us for yourself and our hearts are restless 
until they rest in you. And that is so true, isn't it? Our hearts are restless until they rest in Christ. And we see this second then, not only in this greed explained, but this greed illustrated with this teaching and with this warning, Jesus gives an illustration. He gives a parable. You remember what a parable is. It's a story that comes alongside the truth. That's what it means. And it's, in many ways, a very straightforward parable. There was a man, most likely was a landowner. We might say he was a land baron, probably had a lot of land, probably sectioned off that land to others who paid him in portions of the crops. And he noticed that this man was already rich. It says the land of a rich man produced plentiful. He didn't need this crop. He didn't need this money. In order to be rich, he already was rich, or at least deemed rich. And this rich man, as it says, had a bumper year, had a crop that produced plentifully, it says. And so what does this man do? Well, notice he starts with a very good question. Verse 17, what shall I do? What shall I do? Because I have a a problem. I have nowhere to store my crops. You say, this is a, a problem. It's a good problem. You might even say it's a first world problem. I have too much. And so he begins with, what shall I do? And what should have been his second question? God, what would you have me to do? How could I glorify you in this? But that is not what he says, and that is not what he asks. Why? Because he's a fool. What does he say? Well, he comes up with his own solution, doesn't he? I will do this. And what is that solution? I will tear down my barns and I'll build larger ones. And there I'll store all my grains and all my goods. Now, is there anything necessarily wrong with his solution? Not necessarily, but why does he want to to build bigger and greater barns? Well, we really get the motivation, don't we, in verse 19. Then I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. Why does he want to do what he's going to do? Well, it's for pure self-indulgence, isn't it? For his own self-good, even for his own self-preservation, we would say. This man was concerned for one thing, himself, and that's it. And in fact, you, you see that throughout his response, don't you? Notice this. What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. I will store up all my grain and all my goods. And I will say to my soul, 10 times he refers to himself in two verses in the form of the first person pronoun. In fact, he's so conceited, you'd say, so self-centered that he talks to himself and to his own soul. Probably because he thought no one was as wise as he is. He has such a high view of himself that he is alone at the top. It is him and there is no one else and therefore no one's opinion really matters. But what is his true problem? His true problem is he's a fool. And so he's misconstrued himself and his own significance. He's misunderstood his own possessions. Notice he speaks of his field, his crops, his barns, his grain, his goods. But in the reality, none of it belongs to him, does it? Nor does he have ultimate control over it. At best, he's a steward of it, more likely a servant of it. But how he sees it is he's lord over it. And that's how he acts, that he could ultimately provide for himself. Worse, he miscalculates his time. Notice, you have ample goods laid up for many years. He thinks because as a result of this, this will provide for him for, for many years, but 
what will we soon realize that he doesn't have many years, does he? William Barclay, in one of his commentaries, tells the story of three apprentice devils. And it was the time for their final test, and so Satan comes and asks them what they're going to do to be able to tempt and ruin men on earth. And the first devil says, well, I'll tell them that there's no God. And Satan said, that will not do because most cannot deny God's existence. The second says, I will tell men that there's no hell. And Satan answered, that will not do either because most have endured long enough on earth to know that hell is a possibility. The third says, I will tell men that there is no hurry. And Satan replied, excellent. You will ruin men by the thousands. The most dangerous of delusions is that there's plenty of time. And that's what this man thought, that he had many years. But what is the reality? Well, if you were with us in Sunday school, there is only one that is not affected by time, and that is God himself, because he is eternal. He is above time. He is over time. He has all the time, but we are none of those things. We are under time, and time is calculated for us. And so this man miscalculated his time and how long he had, but perhaps even worse, this man misjudged his own soul. He speaks to his own soul. He tries to pacify his own soul, perhaps tries to appease his restless soul, thinking that it would be satisfied, it would be soothed with having many things and many goods. But it would not be, as we already discussed. And so do you see it? He misconstrued himself. He misunderstood his possessions. He miscalculated his time. He misjudged his own soul. We'd say he missed, he missed, he missed, he missed. Shakespeare has a famous play, Comedy of Errors. This man made many errors, but there's nothing comedic about it, is it? And so you can imagine the startle and the fright when there was another voice that was not his own. And whose voice is that? Well, you see it in verse 20, the voice of God saying to him, you fool, this night your soul is required of you and the things that you've prepared, whose will they be? What is the assessment of God when he looks at this man and all that he has and all that he was able to do and all that he was able to accomplish? Foolishness. And he was a fool. The soul and the life and the possessions and the wealth that he thought that he had control over, he didn't. And in fact, it was all required of him. It was all cal- called to account. All of those things that he had prized, God asked, whose will they be now? They won't be yours. How valuable will they be to you in death? They won't be valuable at all. All that you valued in life is as nothing. And as a result, you'll be thinking and having to contemplate your miscalculations and your misconceptions in an eternity of hell. Foolish is the ultimate response of our God towards such a man. And in fact, when we look out again, apply this to ourselves, apply this to our culture. When we look out at American culture, we'd have to say that God's estimation of it is foolishness. And that we live like fools. That if we think that is what life is about, that is foolish, isn't it? Again, what does it profit a man to to gain the whole world, have it all, yet forfeit your soul? Mankind indeed will spend the entirety of his life trying to increase his state and increase his wealth, but not even spend a fraction of that time on the eternal state of his soul. So how do we apply all of this? Well, there's so many applications, it's hard to choose, but I'll begin with this. We need to be reminded of the simple truth that all of life is from God. And therefore, everything that we have is a gift of God. And we come into this world with with nothing. We have our hands open and, and God by his benevolence and God by his grace puts these wonderful things into our lives. 
But what happens oftentimes is our sinful human nature begins to close that fist and begins to say, mine. And even when we don't have it, that should be mine. And honestly, when you think about that, that aspect of us being able to say to the Creator God, the Maker of all things, mine. How foolish is that? I'll tell you how foolish it is. It's like an ant that comes into your house today and say, this house is mine. And you would say, again, not that you're going to talk to an ant, but go with me. You're an ant. You're not even big enough to own anything. I'm saying in comparison to the infinite God, we are not bigger. We are not stronger than even an ant. No, we're much, much less. All our possessions, all our money, all of our family, all of our days, all of our lives are not ours, but they are God's. And how much of it will you leave behind? All of it. Right? Naked we enter into this world and naked we will leave. And so that's why Jesus says in verse 21, the conclusion, so is the one who lays up treasure for himself but is not rich towards God. Who is this one? He is a a fool, Jesus says, who lays up treasure for himself but is not rich towards God. And so what is the cure for greed and covetousness? It's not necessarily doing with less, although we probably all could do with less, but rather it is being rich towards God. What does that mean? Does that mean God is in need of our money or our things? No. God, as they say, is not in need of nothing, not even a a penny. And so Jesus isn't speaking about money per se. What does it mean to be rich towards God? I think it means this, that God is your greatest possession, your most valued treasure more than anything else. And as such, he will have preeminence above all. And anything that tries to be on the same level as him, he'll tear down. And how do we know if that is true? How do we know if things are of a higher level, a higher value, a higher preeminence of God? Well, we'll value that more than we value him. But if we value him before all else, that shapes everything, doesn't it? It shapes the view that we look at our possessions and our money and our purchases and our wealth. Because ultimately, we want to reflect that God indeed is our highest and greatest treasure of all. And I think that is, ultimately, if you're in Christ, that is your desire. And so, how do we cultivate that? Well, I think Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9, when he says this, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. Do you hear what Paul is saying? If you're in Christ, you are rich. Not because of where you live, not because of what you possess, not because of the figure that is in your bank account or in your retirement. We are rich because of Christ, because what Christ has given to us, Christ has given us all that we stand in need of. That he took our poverty, he took our greed, he took our covetousness, he took our wickedness, and he gave us his riches, his perfect righteousness, his perfection so that we now in Christ might be rich. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, that is true riches, isn't it? It does not come from anything in this earth or on this earth. It comes from the one that came from heaven to earth to be an atonement for our sins. That is why we see in the rest of the Gospels that he is to be the treasure 
that he is to be the treasure that is hidden in the field, the one that sells everything in order to obtain it. He is the pearl of great price because there is no greater treasure than the Lord Jesus Christ. And so don't miss it. If you miss it, then you are a fool. You are foolish. You will live your life in a foolish manner just like this rich fool did. Understand that if you possess Christ, you possess everything in heaven and on earth. And therefore, you can have it all and have nothing, but if you have him, you have everything. And that, my friends, again, transforms how we look at everything of our life, how we see the world, our money, our lives. We live differently as a result. I'll I'll finish with this. I wish all of you could have been with our missions committee this week as we had Andy Young, one of our church planners and missionaries from Oxford, England, who was coming through town. And about five years ago, he, along with some others, planted Oxford Presbyterian Church there in Oxford, England. And he was telling us with much joy that they were just able to uh, secure their first permanent building in the city square of Oxford. And how this building had history to it. It was, in fact, built in 1871 as a Methodist chapel. And there it served as the home of the Oxford Intercollegiate Christian Union for over 60 years. The likes of Martin Lloyd-Jones and uh, John Stott, if you know those names, would have taught in this place two students, the students there in Oxford. J.I. Packer, if you know him and know his book, Knowing God, great book, credits his spiritual formation to what happened in that particular building. And essentially, since World War II, it's been used for everything but a church, and in many ways, everything but that which would be Christ and Christianity. It was used as a community center, it was used as a bar, it's been used as a restaurant. But now, 80 years later, what's happening week to week is that the praises of the Lord and the preaching of God's word is going forth in that place and in that space, and in that building. And more than just a church building, the the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is being built up and people are coming to the Lord. Students, some of the the brightest and the most elite of the world that are going to Oxford are, are discovering that life is not about academia or the prospects of getting a lot of money or wealth that that is not ultimately fulfilling, but they are discovering the treasure of great price. The true treasure, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Reverend Young was coming through town on his way to another church in North Carolina where he's at this weekend. But he wanted to come through, he wanted to stop, and he wanted to say thanks. He wanted to say thanks to our missions committee. He wanted to say thanks to you. Because this church was one of the first churches that supported him way back in 2019 when they began with nothing. And they were able to to do what they were able to do by God's grace and through his spirit, but also through your generous giving, through you being rich towards God. And as I listened to him, I thought, now this, this is truly priceless. This is a a true investment where there are eternal dividends being made. This is where true joy is found. This is where there is true purpose. And I hope this morning, through this passage, through even this testimony of Pastor Young, we would see the same. That we would know that we are so rich. Rich in Christ. And what our lives and our hearts and our attitudes and our actions demonstrate that. All for his glory and all by his grace. Join me in prayer.
Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, Lord, when it comes to our wallet and our pocketbook, oftentimes we don't like to be told what to do, even by you. And yet, Lord, a passage like this demonstrates that you invade every aspect of our life. There is not one part that we can say, well, this is mine, and you have no right to it. And so, Lord, as we think through the truth of this scripture, as it convicts our own heart and it convicts our own mind, oh, Lord, we desire to not be covetous. We desire not to be greedy. We desire to be generous. We desire to live in such a way that demonstrates that we are rich towards you, rich towards others, that we value you and we value others before we value ourselves, and that our wealth and our money and our possessions would demonstrate that, that those would just be conduits to greater glory for you and greater good for our fellow man. And so, Lord, would we have this generous mentality, this generous heart, knowing that if we have Christ, we have all that we need. We have everything. And as a result, we are rich because of Christ taking our poverty and giving us the greatest riches, his righteous robes, that we are made perfect and right for all of eternity. And in eternity, that is all that will matter. Not what we have accomplished, not that which we have attained, not which we have been able to put away or store away, O oh Lord, but what we have done for you and what you have done for us. That will be our praise for all of eternity. We thank you for it. In Christ, our Savior's name, amen.